Hi, this is Tamara Jinjik from Fashion Roundtable. I'm here with William Bain from the British Retail Consortium. William, it's really nice to have you here. Could you just um, give us an overview of what the BRC, the British Retail Consortium, do and what your job there is and also the issues that you're working on? Hi there. Uh, well, we're the trade body for retail companies in the UK. Uh, so we go from the corner shop to the high street to online marketplaces. And um, uh, I cover off the uh, Brexit and trade uh, briefs at the BRC. Um, so that means we're helping companies with the new VAT arrangements on leaving the EU, uh, as well as what uh, the other free trade agreement discussions that the UK is having will mean in the future uh, for companies trading with the rest of the world. So obviously this is a very busy week in the Brexit trade negotiation. So I'm sure it's um, what what have you? It's been really busy for you. I'm sure over the last few years with that. But what do you feel the sector needs to be aware of and look out for? Well, I think the the key thing we're waiting for is what the terms of the EU UK deal will look like if, mm. if there is one. Um, uh, I mean, I think the as they say, the old phrase is the devil is in the detail. And uh, we've been talking in a sense in abstract for several months about what a deal would look like, how the negotiation is going. I think some of the key things that for the fashion industry will be critical if and when there is a trade agreement is what are the terms of the rules of origin? And uh, this is a really important point because we've focused a lot about having a zero tariff agreement. But if the rules of origin are quite constrictive, um, then that means that potentially some products, which at the moment don't attract duty, uh, will not qualify for zero tariffs under that trade agreement. And so this brings the essential point that a trade agreement is very different from a customs union. Mm -hmm. And there are many issues, I think, with supply chains and sourcing chains that retailers will have to be very much aware of when we get the details of any trade agreement. Um, because um, having rules of origin that cut across your supply chain uh, mean that instead of being able to move product across the whole of Europe, as now, uh, between the EU and the UK, may not be uh, as easy to do without paying significant extra duties, um, even under a trade agreement. So it is going to affect everything, including sourcing and supply chains. And we're not going to know how exactly it's going to affect fashion until we get the details of what any deal would look like. Which puts a just-in-time business model, even more of a just-in-time business model, which is so, you know, I mean, we've known about these issues, haven't we, since 2016 and before when we were, um, you know, on whatever side of the fence advocating um, yeah. before the Brexit referendum. So this isn't actually news to people who have been a part of these conversations. It just seems to be a very, um, it's it's essential that these points are put across because that's a really important factor. You know, rules of origin is going to be just as important as the trade deal, even though a lot of us, myself included, have been focused on trade deal negotiations. Um, the work that um, you and I have also been covering a lot has been that it's, it's quite unwieldy to speak about in terms of the naming of it, but it's the VAT retail export scheme. It's something that I really hope they don't reverse. And actually, I would encourage that they did it for all countries so that they entice business. Um, what have you been doing on uh, on this? And, and why do you at the BRC agree that this is so important? Well, it's very important for jobs and to boost retail sales right across the UK. <clears throat> I mean, last week was very interesting because we saw the Office for Budget Responsibilities costings of the government's plan to abolish the retail export scheme and also the airside extra statutory concession, uh, which supports sales at airports. Um, and the figures were actually quite damning of the government's costings. The government said it was going to effectively save 900 million a year uh, by getting rid of these reliefs. Uh, the OBR said really it's only half a billion a year. Um, so the figures were, were were quite different. And it said the government had um, perhaps not been as careful as they could have been in looking at the impact on price elasticity. I mean, this is the, the issue that if we're uh, 
uh, having tourists coming to the UK who want shopping as part of that tourist experience, mm. and they can't get tax-free shopping as readily as, as they could before, there are other alternatives out there like Paris, Madrid, and Barcelona, mm. uh, where people can shop for those types of goods. So, I mean, sadly, despite the help that I think the OBR report gave to campaigners who want to retain these reliefs, we also got word last week that the government plans to lay the legislation, uh, which will scrap these reliefs uh, later this week. And there isn't going to be an opportunity for MPs to vote against it. Um, so it looks pretty much as if this measure will go through. <clears throat> but whilst I think retailers may have lost the battle, um, there is still the long haul in terms of making the argument <clears throat> that even next year, there can be a replacement scheme put in place, uh, which would restore tax-free shopping at a time in which the retail industry is in much need of support. Um, you know, this is a hammer blow uh, if we lose this altogether in terms of trying to build back better for retail and seeing a recover, recovery for the industry that's had a really difficult year uh, with, with the pandemic. I mean, build back um, better being the um, Conservative government's tagline, and of course, build back better would be encouraging business back um, and to support um, tourism and hospitality, which are embedded in the tourist experience. And you're right that the consumer now, especially the fashion consumer, is really savvy about how they shop and they'll do a price comparison. And in a year when Charles de Gaulle is now um, getting more flights um, than, than Heathrow, um, we've heard from um, a lot of different organisations about this and it is something that I just think goes against supporting building back better um, and the evidence is there in the data. What's interesting is the government's data seems to be different to our data which is why it's, it's um, being it's challenging one set of figures with another set of figures and making that argument but you're right if they can't vote against it I know there's going to be an early day motion um, on this so I'm hopeful that we can get some noise but I, for me it seems so counterintuitive that I can't even actually believe William that we've been having to campaign on this because it seems so against what you would think would be the next steps in a post-Brexit economy after a pandemic um, the other thing that you've been working on a lot has been fit to trade I know it's been other members of, of, of the BRC that have been working on that but could you just briefly outline that for us as well well, of course, um, we tend to talk a lot about trade as being about imports, um, but also there's a big export agenda as well. And that is where, you know, we are trying to work with, um, you know, DIT and other UK government departments. So DIT is the Department of International Trade. Yep, to, to maximise the, the benefit that retail can get in terms of the trade preferences that currently exist. Um, you know, but also looking ahead to, you know, uh, other opportunities after the 1st of January um, in terms of new trade agreements that, but, that might be negotiated. So, so there's a number which are, I think, quite interesting in terms of uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we know the government's very interested in acceding to CPTPP, uh, which what, is, what is the... That? Uh, the 11 strong trading bloc who have an agreement in Asia Pacific, uh, which Japan are in and Canada are in. Um, uh, and that also would allow for opportunities, I think, in terms of fashion and, and, and retail. Um, you know, it's all relative. I mean, I mean, clearly being out of the single market and customs union is going to create some significant challenges that we've explored earlier in, mm. in this interview. But but in terms of where we are and where we'll find ourselves on the 1st of January, uh, we've got to sort of try and make sure we get the most for the industry out of the trade deals that the UK is going to try and try and do. And I think it's also about trying to, um, you know, work with, um, you know, industry bodies in, in, in Asia and try and develop our markets because sometimes you can have a trade agreement, you can have uh, trade preferences and they're not as well known, they're not as utilised as, as they could be. Um, you know, there's that well-known stats that, um, you know, uh, Germany had the same uh, trade agreements as the UK for nearly half a century and yet it does three and a half times more trade with, with China. 
than the UK does. So, so there's a big role that government and industry have got in trying to promote exports, um, uh, lessen those barriers to 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 market access, um, and to promote wonderful and creative and inventive British fashion. Thank you. And I, th- I think the last question would be really about um, America and where you see potentials for why policy and why our engagement um, as people that, lo- that advocate or lobby on behalf of, of, sec- of the sector, why that deal will be so important in a post for, for, for the UK post Brexit and what it could mean for the wider uh, UK, US trade um, for the sector. What do, you th- what do you think it could offer? Um, I, I mean, the key sense is the, the kind of the geopolitics of it, you know, what cooperation are we able to, to achieve? Um, I mean, tariff reductions are one thing, but modern trade agreements now are looking at digital trade, online commerce. So I suppose the sort of greatest thing which these negotiations could do is to make it easier to buy and sell goods across the Atlantic. Uh, by improving the provisions for e-commerce, uh, the rights for consumers, clarifying some of the, the tax arrangements uh, around that. I think that's where the real benefit is is going to be for, for fashion. Um, not so much uh, from you know, a, a few percent here or there off, off tariffs, um, not uh, downplaying that for a minute, but, but I think in expanding e-commerce and facilitating digital trade, making customs a lot easier uh, between the US and the UK. Those are the big wins in terms of being able to get more goods to market and get them to, to market into the consumer much more quickly. Yeah. Um, there will always be some barriers of being in a different custom system, um, but we can diminish those by what can be done in terms of that uh, FTA negotiation. And I think also, uh, you know, after the 20th of January, I'd be hopeful that the EU as well uh, is able to uh, get to a much better place in terms of trading relations uh, with the US than it's obviously had for not just the last four years, but but even before that with things like the Airbus and Boeing disputes. So if we can start to resolve that, I think we can expect to see a boost for fashion, not just in Britain, but in Europe as well, in terms of uh, its trade with the US. And do you think that the the new president will give a different lens? Obviously, he's, he's concerned about sustainability, but he's also made it very clear that his Irish heritage is very important to him. So what kind of Brexit deal is actually funnily enough being framed now through the lens of what happens in Washington as much as it is what happens in Brussels. Do you think that that, that his loyalty to his Irish heritage will play a part in the American, the US-UK trade deal? Um, I think clearly the uh, congressional Democrats um, will have some slightly different priorities and this administration as well may have slightly different priorities from from the current one. Um, So, for example, they may want to see more chapters in the agreement in terms of ensuring that the UK complies with all of its rules in terms of sustainability on on labour as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we know there have been some issues in parts of of the UK with compliance with labour legislation. Mm -hmm. That will be a big deal for for the Democrats uh, in terms of the UK-US negotiations. So I would expect a much tougher, firmer chapter in any agreement on on that. I think the, the most significant thing is just the support of the new administration for multilateralism. Mm. One of the things that can really help global trade is to get the World Trade Organization working um, as efficiently as it could. The risk was it might even have collapsed uh, if America had pulled out, uh, if the current administration had been returned by American voters. So getting the appellate body up and running again so that we have a forum to decide cases you know, we, we resolve some of these disputes like the Airbus Boeing dispute. We end sort of punitive tariffs being imposed outside of normal rule structures. That is something that will help trade okay. and help fashion. And a big agenda at the WTO is going to be around e-commerce. Uh, we have big discussions at the G7 and G20 next year 
um, on things like digital taxes. These are all things that will affect the trade in fashion. And if we make the right choices, if we can restore multilateralism, uh, defeat protectionism uh, on, on these issues next year, then I think we have a better future ahead. Uh, and also it allows an even playing field for someone who's having to pay bricks and mortar costs, um, such as the struggling high street, um, as the online players who've managed to swerve some of the taxation and the responsibilities and have been at the forefront, not only of the issues of, of worker exploitation, but also of non-payment of, um, of taxation across the world. So I think that's a really important point. William, I really appreciate your time. You're such a busy person and you're such a font of knowledge. I always learn so much. Um, thank you very much for coming on this. Thank you.